and welcome to the Westmoreland Museum of American Arts virtual programming. In conjunction with the African American art in the 20th century, we are introducing a virtual film series. This series features works by the pioneers of early African American cinema. The film we will be viewing this evening is The Blood of Jesus. We have two speakers with us tonight, Kenneth Nicholson, is a visual artist and adjunct instructor at Seton Hill University of Pitt and the University of Pitt at Greensburg and the Westmoreland County Community College. And Joseph Lewis is the executive director of the Jazz Bridge Project and founder and curator of the Black Bottom Film Festival presented by the August Wilson African American Cultural Center. All right, let's meet our speakers this evening. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Hi. Hi. All right, well, I will let you get to it. I'm gonna head backstage and um, you can take it from here. All right, sounds good. Thanks, Mona. So just like Mona said, this week we're going to be watching another film by the prolific Spencer Williams, but this is going to be his first full length film. Now, last month we watched his 1946 film, Dirty Gertie from Harlem, USA, which showed Williams merging a kind of independent uh, cinematic sensibilities with a more Hollywood influenced approach. But we're going to find that The Blood of Jesus has a little bit more of an auteur touch to it. So a few things to pay attention to before we get started. The first being how music tonight is going to play a much more important role within the film, especially more than the previous screenings that we've had. It's also going to help kind of distinguish in terms of the narrative uh, scenes of a godly life versus that of a sinful one. And another thing to take note of are the special effects, which of course are going to seem a little bit rough around the edges, but in terms of 1940s independent cinema, very, very impressive. Yo, do you have anything you would like to add before we get started? Also, uh, yes, yes, thanks, Ken. Um... The other thing, the, the other question of when you say he looks at it like an auteur, um, it's the fact that he asks he asks the age old question amongst black folks, and that is to worship a god of the oppressor. You know that sort of that sort of dichotomy, that duality of wor worshiping um, Jesus, if you will, uh, and while you're catching hell on 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 planet Earth. Yeah. So that that's that's sort of the the sort of challenge that is uh, as the themes that will be examined in this picture as well. Absolutely, this is going to be a, feel like a much more personal film. Exactly. Than we've seen them previously. And this is that that's always a personal qu a question amongst Black folks. Let's roll. All right. Sounds good. The new 
Good news, that is coming. Good news, that is coming. And the Lord leads me high. There's a long white robe in the heaven, I know. There's a long white robe in the heaven. accepted laws of every civilized country and nation on the face of the globe. When those who prayed on their knees in church on Sunday did not go back to their homes to pray on their neighbors the remaining six days of the week. When religion was practiced with unfalse solemnity and honest sincerity, and when soul salvation was a heritage from heaven to not merely a few thousand but to many millions, those days are almost gone from the earth. Almost. This my robe. When we get to heaven, we're going to put on the robe. We're going to shout all over to heaven. Heaven. Everybody's going to shout heaven. They ain't going to heaven. Heaven. going to shout all over to heaven. You got a crown, all got a you got a crown. When you get to heaven, you're going to put on the crown, you're going to shout all over about heaven. Heaven, heaven. Everybody's going to shout heaven, they ain't going to heaven. Heaven, heaven. heaven. Going to shout all over about heaven. I've got a crown, when you get to heaven, you're going to put on the crown, you're going to shout all over about heaven. Heaven, heaven. Everybody's talking about heaven, they ain't going to heaven. 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 On Jordan's stormy bank I stand and cast a wishful eye. On
because that gal don't act like she got nothing. She sure don't, Sister Elby. But I think she's a little worried because Rass didn't come to see her get baptized. Why me here? No, he came past my house early this morning with a gun on his shoulder, said he's going to hunt me. Mm, mm, mm. And on a Sunday, too. In obedience to the Savior's command and upon the profession of your faith, I'll now baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Sister Jenkins, I just can't get over Rats Jack going uh, uh, hunting today and his wife being baptized. They've just been married three months. They sure have. But, uh, oh, uh, excuse me a minute, Sister Elby, but I got to go here and take her this robe so she won't get a catch of cold. Yes, yes, yes. Go right ahead, Sister Jane. Keep quiet, bro. Hey, yeah. 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 stay. Keep quiet, Man, you said stay, bro. You said snake, don't you? Keep quiet. Brother, snake, I tell you. You said snake. Snake. Come on, come on. 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 Come Now, Dodie, you better lay down a little while. All right, Sister Jenkins, I sure will. Well, I guess I better be getting on home now, Sister Jackson. All right, Sister Jenkins, thank you. Thank you very much. You welcome, child. You welcome. Well, Jackson, do you have any luck? Oh, uh, not much, Sister Jenkins. Just a couple of rabbits, that's all. Oh, the big ones, too, ain't I bet they show sure is fast. Oh, they ain't so fat, Miss Jenkins. Uh, I mean, they ain't as fat as they look. Uh, they just look that way because they're in that sack. No, ma'am, them rabbits ain't that fat. No, ma'am. Boy, these rabbits bow to be fat heavy as this sack is. Let me see. Uh, oh, look out there, Miss Jenkins. Uh, that nail ain't very strong. It, it's liable to pull out. Uh, oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. I'll, I'll hang it over here against the wall, you know. Well, I guess I better be going, Brother Jackson. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Miss Jenkins. Thank you very much for looking after Martha. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. What is it, honey? Whose hogs is in you got in that sack? Well, they, they uh, well, 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 they ain't nobody's, honey. Uh, uh, them, them wild hogs. They don't belong to nobody. Now, Raz Jackson, you know they ain't no wild hogs in them woods. Every hog out there belongs to somebody. I guess you're right, honey. But you know, we didn't have a thing to eat in this house. If I hadn't been lucky enough to run up on them two shoulders, you wouldn't have had nothing to eat for supper tonight. Lord, how much is Sister Elby coming in? Won't you have a seat? No, Sister Jenkins, I just thought I'd come by to tell you Luke Billis almost broke up the baptizing after you left. What? Again? Yes, last year he saw an alligator. This year it was a snake. <laughs> I'd say it was the devil both times. I do, too. Say, hey, Sister Jenkins, what you do about Sister Jackson? My gracious child, listen. 
Shall not, Sister Dinkins? Yes, ma'am. I had both hands right on them. Mm, mm, mm. Rad. What you want now, honey? Why don't you try to pray and get religion? We could be so much happier if you would. Okay, honey, I'll try. Not the 
jacket. Jackson. I know how you feel, but it ain't no need of you worrying yourself like that. If it's the Lord's will for her to stay, she'll stay. And if it's the Lord's will for her to go, she'll go. He sure is taking it hard, ain't it, Sister Jenkins? He sure will. But she ain't got a chance, Sister Elm. How come? The doctor said the bullet would clean through her and then come out through this picture over here. He sure did. Come on, sisters and brothers. Let us kneel down and pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, we bow down before you this evening to pray for one of your children, Sister Martha Ann Jackson. Amen. Lord, Sister Martha Ann is a brand new soldier of the cross. Sure sure is. Is. She ain't had time to buckle on a sword and go out in the battlefield and fight. Oh, Lord. We need the Lord. Yeah. We sure do, Lord. We need the down here amongst us. Sure. Oh, we need them. Although her husband, brother Raz Jackson, has strayed from the path of righteousness all his life, yes. Lord, he needs it too. He yes, he he now this evening, our Heavenly Father, we bow down before your throne of grace, yeah. asking you to come down into this veil of sorrow yes. and make Sister Martha and well again. Yes. Lord, we know that you and only you uh, can move the misery from this pain rag body. Yes, Lord. We know, Lord, that you and only you can come down and drive the misery away. Yes, Lord. We know, Lord, that you and only you uh, can drive the sin from Brother Raz Jackson's heart yes, and, and make him see the light. Yes, yes Lord. Please, Lord. Come down yeah. and make yeah. Sister Martha and well again. Yeah. We ask these blessings in the name of the Father and your Son who died on the cross and the Holy Ghost forever. Amen. Amen. Amen.
is the end of the trail. Here, all is silent, save for the murmurs of grief and the muffled sobbing of those who have long since departed from among the living. But why do they mourn? They mourn because their efforts are yet unrewarded, because the unjust have struck down the good and the unselfish, because sin is enthroned in the seat of power. These were all good people. They came to the earth bringing love and truth and were hated in return. They came to teach the gospel and were treated with scorn. They came bringing redemption and were stoned and crucified. Oh, that the children of men should be so blind. Yet, it has ever been so that the righteous have been treated with contempt and almost driven from the face of the earth. But they have not died in vain. Each succeeding generation has built monuments to their memory. Look there. And there. And there. These monuments are the treasures of the human race. Slowly, human race moves forward, but it does move forward. Yes, but why have you brought me here? Is this the end of the trail for me? No, there is no place for you here yet. Come with me.
that road leads to the highway of life. There, at the crossroads, you will find that which you seek. The road to the right leads to happiness and eternal life. The road to the left leads to death, hell, and destruction. Be on your way, but walk clear of temptation and beware of the hypocrite and the false prophet. Go. There she goes. You know what to do. Okay, Judas. Go ahead. Do your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Ah! Oh, oh. really beautiful, isn't it? I didn't mean to frighten you. Green is my name. Judas Green. And yours? Uh, my name is Martha Ann Jackson. Beautiful name, but not half as beautiful as the one that owns it. And you know, I've got something right here in this bag that'll make you even more lovely. Now, isn't that a gorgeous thing? Yeah, take it. Take it. You'll be needing something like that in the city. And look, here are shoes to match it. And just to think, they're your size. And they are all yours, too. Be not over anxious for what you shall put on. Life is a more wonderful gift than clothing for the body. Why, in the city, a girl would be a queen with those on. And you know you've got to wear clothes. The law says so. Your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Go ahead and keep them. They don't cost you anything. Sell not your soul for the raiment of a peacock. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, wouldn't you look funny in the city with nothing on but that nightgown? Well, honey, how did you like that? Oh, that was good. All right, all right, all right, ladies and gentlemen. We will now bring to you Miss Bernice Gaines doing for you her acrobatic dance. Miss Gaines. <laughs>
in. Now we'll bring to you Miss Gussie Smith. We'll sing a number for you. Come on, Gussie. Give her a great big hand. <laughs> Mr. Rufus Brown. How do you do, Miss Jackson? I'm glad to know you, Mr. Brown. Won't you sit down? Oh, oh, thanks. <laughs> Mr. Brown is a businessman in the city, and he thinks he can put you to work right away. Yeah, I think you'll do all right, Mr. Green. Oh, that would be fine, Mr. Brown. Well, you see, the best part about it, you'll be making plenty of money, and you won't have to work hard to make it. All you got to do is come on down to my place. Ow. Oh, <laughs> 
job you offered me. Uh, I think I've gone to the crossroads. Listen, sister, I didn't pay Judith Green $30 for that dress you got on, for them shoes you got on. And if it's going to be the deciding done, I'm going to do it and not you. Now hurry up and get on downstairs and get busy. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. Remember what that fella said? He said you'll be making plenty of money and you won't have to work hard to get it. <laughs> now, ain't that nice? Go ahead. Anyway, it's too late to turn back now. <laughs> Take heed that no man deceive you. There's forgiveness between the cup and the lip. There's life between the stirrup and the ground. Go while there is still time. Let's go get her. Let's go get her. Oh, no, 
Run, child, run, the devil behind you. 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 Run to our run, they run 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 behind you. Keep on praying, he may get him. Keep on praying, he may get him. Keep on praying, he may get him. Leave him far behind. Oh, run, Jesus, he may get him. Run, Jesus, he may get him. Run, Jesus, he may get him. Leave him far behind. Oh, die is right down behind you. Die is right down behind you. Die is right down behind you. Leave him far behind. Oh, run, child, run, go on, glory. Run, child, run, go on, glory. Run, child, run, go on, glory. <laughs> Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art now on holy ground. There she is. Yeah, we got her now. That's her, all right. Sure, that's her. I ought to mash your brains out with this rock. Stop. What hath this woman done? She stole my money, Lord. She, she, she ain't no good. She always robbed somebody. She robbed me once. She, she's a sinner. He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her.
Is you all right, honey? Yes, Red. I'm all right. I'm going to get well. Why did they stop singing? I like to hear them sing. Sister Jenkins! Sister Jenkins! Sister Jenkins! Look, Sister Jenkins! Look, 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 look. there she is! Look at her. See? She's all right. She's going to get well. Children, the good Lord. The new child's coming. The new child's coming. The new child's coming. And I don't want to leave me behind. The new child's coming. The new child's coming. The new child's coming. And I don't want to leave me behind. Welcome back, everyone. <laughs> Welcome back. So, Joe, did you have any like initial thoughts or things that you would like to discuss before we talk about the film? Yeah, I mean, first, um, I didn't, 
I didn't know Spencer Williams was such a, a dynamic individual. That's the first thing. I, I mean, you know, I have a my father's 80 years old. And of course, in 1951, when Amos and Andy came on or, you know, hit the airwaves on television, of course, it was popular on the radio. And two white gentlemen played Amos and Andy on the radio. So when they when they did Amos and Andy on television, you know, I asked my dad. Did you watch Amos and Andy when you were a kid? And he says. No, nah, I didn't like it because I thought it was too stereotypical. And he said, I watched a few episodes, but it was always embarrassing. But then I said, did you know that Andy was a person who wrote and directed movies and was a pioneer, a, a sound engineer, a, a, a World War I veteran, um, a person who wrote the first African-American talkie? He was like, oh, my God, I did not know that. You know, I did not know that. That's a, that was a revelation to my dad, who's 80 years old. And um, I also thought it was fascinating. You know, this is, you know, the fact that he directed and wrote and produced this. Um, that he hit a lot of themes that um, that are reoccurring in in life in general and in black uh, culture in particular. For one, um, the gossiping, signifying um, ladies at the beginning, the church ladies. You know, that's that's a theme that 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 reoccurs. I mean, the first thing I thought of was Alvin Ailey, Alvin Ailey's Revelations, which it starts off, you know, the, the choreography for Revelations, the, the uh, dance number from the Alvin Ailey, you know, uh, dance theater. Um, the world famous, of course, um, it starts off with church ladies gossiping. You know, I mean, behind behind their uh, church fans. Um, also, I thought it was it was you know deep that, um, you know, black culture, uh, music, dancing uh, is associated with vice and sin. You know, that's something that's always happening. You know, if Ken, you're a lot younger than me, but you have no idea how resisted. Uh, how people resisted hip hop music. And it's very similar to how they resisted jazz and blues and black culture back in the thirties and forties. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was great as well. I thought that was, you know, um, pretty interesting. And then I also thought of some of the scenes uh, that was, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I thought some of the scenes that, um, that were some of the, the, the dialogue in the, in the, um, uh, movie was interesting too. You know, um, one that always my grandfather used to say to me all the time was there's a lot of forgiveness between the cup and the lip, you know? Um, I thought that was great as well. So that, those are some of the things that I, um, you know, just jumped out at me. No, I think when you're talking about like the, uh, the gospel individual, individual, it's really, it's really interesting, interesting to see that that is how we are kind of like led into the narrative and he gives us a little bit of like exposition to really kind of like set us up for what we're going to be watching for the rest of the film that we uh, kind of are introduced to the main characters through a little bit of uh, gossiping. So we see like, we hear about Martha Ann, we hear about right. Raz, and then we kind of like learn a little bit more about them later. So then once we see Raz, we're kind of a little bit more, um, in on whatever he's doing when he's hunting and he's saying that he's hunting um I and he's really he stealing he's somebody else's hogs <laughs> yeah basically absolutely <laughs> so through that like little bit of exposition we're kind of like eased into the narrative but what's interesting is that for me at least to kind of see we've watched what four films now we've right. kind of gone from like 19 and 30 now to like 1941 we watched one of his uh, 46 films last month it's really interesting to see how we have these different approaches to uh, exposition and storytelling right. only right. having an hour to tell this story we need to set up the audience in such a way that they feel kind of grounded in the narrative so yeah absolutely that's like really interesting how he kind of uses these tropes not only to uh, set a particular mood or atmosphere, but to actually help tell the story a little bit more clearly. And then you right. were talking about the ideas uh, behind 
the the resistance in the community to hip hop. Mona and I were talking a little bit last month about the um, in Dirty Gertie how the main character is kind of seen as so like sinful and free and and through like contemporary lens it's like difficult to kind of watch it under the same how do I want to say under the same um with the same reading that right. the filmmakers would have had because it's like Gertie's not bothering anyone everyone's like right. oh, Gertie this whole movie and she's just dancing and singing um but right here we see that kind of split throughout the movie of when gospel is playing with Reverend Robinson's heavenly choir but then when we hear jazz a little bit later on it's in the club and it's right, right. It's, the, it's, it's 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 a den of inequity <laughs> it's really so interesting it's, to think the, 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 the you know the, the the tug of war between the two is 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 uh is is fascinating to me i find it i find it interesting and you're um, making it really clear for the audience yeah yeah absolutely absolutely it's absolutely you have to make a choice who are you rooting for yeah um, and so but you know I, I also find the fact that he did this movie for five thousand dollars i mean it, it i think about some of the movies that were done in 1941. I mean, Citizen Kane was done in 41. I mean, there's a lot of movies. When you compare what, what he had to work with and, and what was happening in, 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 the, larger, in, the, larger, uh, in the larger structure, um, it's like, what, you know, what drive he must have had to say, you know, I'm going to do this movie for $5,000 in Hollywood. Um, with my own, and I'm gonna start. I'm not. I'm gonna play. You know, the protagonist, if you will. Um, and I'm gonna put all these people together. I mean, what chutzpah? I mean, yeah. I mean, what chutzpah? I mean, I'm. I'm in with one camera though. <laughs> That's the crazy thing. He shot the whole thing with one camera, which was. And I think it's really interesting you bring up the five thousand dollars because, uh, for the audience like listening, if you've never like been a part of making a movie before or kind of like privy to what goes on behind the camera, $5,000 might it's, seem like a lot of money. It is absolutely nothing. Nothing. It is um, absolutely even, nothing. Even absolutely in nothing. the thirties and forties, it was, it right. was absolutely nothing. And I think it's so interesting to see how sometimes we're introduced to some of the films that we've been watching over the past few months that oftentimes when I'm reading about them, I uh, see people talking about how they're kind of like rough around the edges and the storytelling can be a little bit clunky. But I think if you're putting it within the context of how honestly incredible it is that this movie was even made under the circumstances that it was, all of those, all of the camera work, and some of the techniques that might seem a little bit less polished come off as so much more impressive because they were done under duress. Absolute duress. I think it's really interesting, even with Spencer Williams, that he kind of made this outside of Hollywood. He right. was working with Alfred Sack, who was helping to uh, produce the film. But oftentimes with these early films, Spencer Williams would drive them around to show communities. It's not necessarily like these films had a wide release or right. a limited release, that it's actually Spencer Williams a lot of times driving them to theaters to uh, sell or, or rent them out so people can actually see them. And that's something that um, isn't really thought about today, but that's something that independent filmmakers had to do uh, quite a bit in the 30s through the 60s or so. I mean, even, even urban legend, you know, um, uh, Master P was 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 acknowledged and revered for his the fact that he was he sold his mixtapes out of the back of his trunk, and that was his. That's how he you know made all of his money to get you know to get some get some brand and some some identification. Um, and here you have Spencer Williams. He was, I mean, he's a pioneer. No one knew about on on every level, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, from a filmmaking standpoint. And it, it's a shame that he gets 
his only claim to fame is the fact that he was an Amos and Andy when he was so, so, so much more. Oh, absolutely. He wrote, directed, but what's he, something Mona and I were talking about last month is that uh, as I was doing a little bit more research, um, he had a part in writing things that he was never even credited for. I know. So if you watch know. Ron's Buckaroo. He's sometimes said about writing that some of that script, and I didn't even know that as we were watching it. I'm talking. I know. About I know. Movie. I know. I know. I know. And then he wrote the first Black Talkie mm -hmm. for um, for the guy, the Christie, Al Christie. You know, he wrote the dialogue for um, the Melancholy Dane. Yeah, he's, 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 he's a Renaissance man that. I mean, and I thought I knew most of the African American Renaissance men and 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 women, and I'm I mean it was I'm pleasantly surprised. I'm pleasantly surprised. Do we have any questions at all from the audience? Or well, while everyone's thinking of a question. One of the things that sticks out to me is this is one of our first instances of seeing special effects. <laughs> and there's like a few different instances. So we see like superimposition, which we, anytime we see like the angel appear on screen, they kind of like dissolve into the screen or kind of uh, or like double exposed. But oftentimes that was something that was done in camera. That was like an in-camera effect, not necessarily something done with editing, but if you notice that there's a couple instances when we're watching the film that the like the effects or things that seem a little bit more um, involved kind of stick out a little bit. I remember watching this for the first time and thinking like, wow, it's like really impressive that he kind of was able to come up with some of these effects. Well, what's interesting is that Spencer Williams actually took stock footage from another film that was made in 1911. So it's uh, Le Inferno. So the, it's based on Dante's Inferno. Uh, Italian film from 1911. He took some of the stock footage of when the individual is climbing the ladder to heaven. Right, he right. Took that stock footage and kind of planted it into his film. It doesn't stick out that much, but it was really inter interesting to see how he was taking whatever he could get. I think oftentimes we don't think that films use stock footage to kind of pad like whether they be like aerial shots or something that would be done by um like the um, second unit camera very very interesting to me for him to kind of know what his financial limitations are and find another way to come up with something that ended up being like really impressive and and um and successful in the film i, I would agree with you because um when you think about that I was doing some research on other, you know, I like to compare it to other films made in, in the year that this was released or, or produced. And Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde was was done in 1941. And, and compare those, I mean, they're pretty close as far as the dissolves to, you know, how when Dr. Jekyll went to Mr. Hyde to, I mean, it's not that far off when you consider that the production values are the, the, the investment. Uh, that they were able to make with Spencer's film, opposed to, you know, this the movie with uh, Spencer Tra uh, Spencer Tracy. So it's it's not. I mean, you know, compared when you compare the two, he's not that far off for a five thousand dollars production. And what you is even more impressive is when we think of Citizen Kane and we think of Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde, like the kind of impact that they had. They had a much wider audience that was available to them that we right. had to think that at this time cinemas were still segregated in a lot I know. of areas so the areas that spencer williams is even going to is still limited as far as who he can uh, reach out to that's why i think during his own career um these films were not really that well known the blood of jesus was successful in terms of um the response that he got back but it didn't really make a great deal of money or anything like that it was just successful enough for him to make like 13 films throughout his his Correct. career but for the longest time these were thought to be lost um they were they were found in a warehouse somewhere in texas in the 80s and 
it wasn't in it, before then they were considered um, absolutely lost because I think he died in 69. He did. He died in 69. He died in 69. He died in 69. One year after uh, Martin Luther King and mm -hmm. all of the other sort of stuff that happened in 68. He wasn't that. He wasn't that old though. He was only 16. He wasn't. He was only like 69, 70 years old. Mm -hmm. A very, very full life. He did live a full life. Uh, it was very impressive to kind of go back and look through his career and see the amount he was able to accomplish with just it seemed ambition uh, and a lot of talent. He he was like you said, like a Renaissance man when it came to writing, acting, directing. He studied vaudeville. He was incredibly entertaining. Uh, but then I also think I read that he also like started like he was. Uh, he, for a while, he was he started a college, yeah. some sort of industrial and, and business school. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the guy was on. I mean, I'm totally impressed. I'm totally impressed by that man. And 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 he's it, and that's unfortunate that he goes down in the annals of popular culture as the buffoon in Amos and Andy when this man was so sophisticated. I, I would I would suspect that he was the life of every party in Hollywood. Oh, absolutely. And I'm absolutely. sure he had so many stories to tell. Um, uh, to I, I just wonder if if the you know the Sidney Portiers of the world and the Harry Belafontes um, if they had an opportunity to interact with him this and, and just to pick his brain or if there would if that type of thing was apropos back then because of you know the sort of militancy of of one one group of people, but not knowing. I wonder if they would have known what Spencer Williams has gone through and what he did to pioneer. If they would have had a level of respect for him, I would have loved to have been a fly on that wall. I would hope because you think like when we think about early African American cinema, Oscar Musho is first name. That we right, right, of. exactly. First name you hear. Absolutely. And then Spencer Williams comes up quite a bit. We see throughout the pioneers of African-American cinema, his films are, are um, scattered throughout that collection. But he's not really... He's not revered more. at all. Yes, absolutely. We have a, a couple questions. I see Melissa said, do we know how he found his actors or on-screen talent? Were they local actors also featured in other films? They were absolutely local but in a lot of these early movies, these actors were not trained actors whatsoever. And I think that no. adds to that kind of like documentary realness that we get with a lot of these early films. Uh, we discussed this a little bit with Dirty Gertie because in that film, I think even more so it, it shows when someone's not an actor because you have a little bit of like longer stretches of, of dialogue that they have to work through. Here we have these kind of like little vignettes that we go from person to person. We have a lot more um, uh, kind of narrative going on um, over top of what we're watching. So it's not always nearly as apparent. It's also, like we said, a lot more of a personal film. So it feels a little bit more intimate when individuals are talking. Um, and, and, and to Melissa's question, I mean... I mean, there is no, there's no, there's really no industry for black actors to participate in. I mean, I mean, that's the, that's the, that's the, you know, you can't say, oh, I'm going to, I mean, even now to, to, in, in 2020, if you, t if a parent tells, tells their, if a child tells their parent that they're going to go be an actor, they're, they're, you know, could you imagine back then in, in 1941 being an African American, there's just, there's no opportunity for you. So for the most part, it, I mean, even even trained actors, Dorothy Dandridge, uh, Lena Horne, I mean, Pearl Bailey. I mean, they didn't get work. Uh, well, Eartha Kitt, one of the, Eartha, you know, they didn't get work. So, you know, it was like, in America. It was, yeah, it was completely organic, completely organic. Absolutely. For, but I think that's really, time. say that again. I said it's been complete. It was completely organic, grassroots. Absolutely. From the root. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's 
also really interesting to kind of see how he's involving the community. Right, right, right. His kind of uh, process uh, in creating the film that he was very, uh, very dedicated. Exactly, yeah. And yeah, all absolutely. the black cast and crew, and then uh, kind of moving forward with that. We see that we have another question of, did the film Blood of Jesus serve as inspiration for any other film or movie? Um, I don't think that this film has served as like a direct inspiration in terms of having like a, um, not like even a sequel or an adaptation other than the, uh, not too long ago, I think it was maybe 2000, it was like in the 2010s, Spike Lee uh, released a, a horror movie called uh, The Sweet Blood of Jesus, but it has nothing to do with this. It's actually a remake of Ganja and Hess from uh, the 70s. But I think indirectly, the inspiration for this film is that he helped to get the ball rolling. Yeah. I mean, and, and it's also in the canon of a lot of movies of, you know, man, you know, God versus material, spirituality versus material. Um, you, you have, um, what's, what's the movie where um, Eve's Bayou is, a, is, is one. Um, Angel Heart is another that comes to mind. Yeah. Sort of uh, the sort of personification of the devil in the film. Um, um, the Devil's Advocate with Al Pacino, and mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's 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 all sort of that sort of. It falls in that in that realm of of movies, I think. And what's so interesting about this film is that even though it is considered a drama, and for most of the film, it is fairly straightforward dramatic mm -hmm. he spencer williams always finds ways to like um pepper in laughs yeah yeah i i, I died a couple of times especially yeah. when 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 they when the when when the devil was at the crossroads with his uh with his uh his merry men, his merry band, and she falls on she falls on the one side, you know, on on the Zion side, and he can't cross over, and yeah. he just runs away from G, from from the, the voice of God, and they just drive off. <laughs> That's actually for me one of the more clever uses of having a limited budget to actually make something more effective. So yeah, I were, mean, it was it was hilarious to me. It was great, though. It was great. They just drove right. off because because yeah. the voice of God said, "Man, get out of here!" And he was like, "All right, fine. Let me let me let me bounce." It was hilarious. If we have like an individual play the God figure. I think it would have even been more comedic. But actually, having just the voice, so much more effective. And and yeah, you know, right. it was more of a financial decision. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure, but it, it just it cracked me up, man. Yeah. And then he then and then and then the when the guy when the gang of of men with the stones came, he said he that it was free of sin cast the first stone, and then they just turned around and ran off because yeah. they knew they were in. They just left the den of inequity, and if they tried to do anything, they'd probably get struck by lightning. Yeah, that cracked me up as well, man. They just they they hot tailed it out of there. And that was throughout all of his um, films. And I think what's really interesting too with like low budget, like especially earlier low budget films, comedy sometimes can be a little bit even more difficult to pull off. And it, you have to have a sense of timing. Yeah, yeah, it was a timing. The timing was impeccable in, in that instance at the crossroads, it was hilarious. Absolutely. Also That's when the guy jumped out of the, out of the, uh, out of the river, when he saw a serpent, when he saw the snake, that was hilarious as well. The same song when he's running away. The same song, right, 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 yeah. right. Absolutely. Was that was quite funny to me. So do we have any other questions? I'm trying to think if we have anything else that we did not cover. Well, I think actually, Joe, one of the first things you mentioned in the intro was when we were discussing the uh, the role 
that religion played like in the community the idea that this is not only known for having a little bit of like a documentary quality to it in the way that it was shot but it's thought of as being one of the first films to truly give a uh, depiction of like a rural uh, like a southern baptist uh, community or, right you, you get the southern the 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 southern baptist community versus the urban ex experience the southern baptist community is good and pure the urban experience is bad and evil you know you know the, the at this at this point this was at the height of the northern migration from the south as well uh, from a historic standpoint um so it it really covered a lot of ground you know from you know that time it was very topical for the times uh and what people were um what people, what people were dealing with what they were going through i mean because there was a there was a lot of people who came from the south went to the north for for opportunities didn't get the opportunities they wanted and went back to the south or or had a sort of bad experience with the sort of difference between urban poverty and 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 rural poverty so that sort of that led to led to a lot of you know led to a lot of you know poverty in the south you can get by a lot easier than poverty in the north that leads to more crime more 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 vice you know you're 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 you need to survive um because you're not on the land you're renting you're you're, rent, you're renting a, pre, a piece of property more so in the urban areas uh you're not living in the your family-owned plot and um you know it spoke to it spoke a, to a lot of the the experiences of black folks in 1941. Absolutely. One of the artists that comes to mind that really touches on uh, that northern migration is Jacob Lawrence. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I think if anyone in the audience is is interested in that, it would be really interesting to compare and contrast those different ideas between what we saw with Spencer Williams and then what Jacob Lawrence was working with as well. And, and, you know, and, and being in a, a family that that migrated from the south to the north, that was always a tug of war between people. Because a lot of my family, after the steel, steel mills closed down in Pittsburgh, they went back. They went back down south because it, they felt more comfortable there, more, more, more. Uh, it, they just felt that the south was more pleasant to them, for them. Yeah. yeah. Very, very interesting. Yeah, it's definitely this movie definitely hit a lot of themes that are are reoccurring or that were very prevalent in uh, African American culture for for quite some time. Absolutely, and I think Spencer Williams, one of his talents is that he's able to kind of juggle all those different ideas while producing a film that was already at its core was going to be a challenge for him. He was already able to kind of add all of these other layers of uh, his own personal experience and uh, viewpoints on top of that. And that's why he's so memorable. Yeah. I mean, he, he's definitely one of my heroes now yeah. after doing the research on this. This is, uh, I have, I've found a new, I'm, I'm definitely going to do more research about him. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that we are about at the uh, finishing line, correct, Mona? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I just pop up. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, thank you both. This was uh, just amazing. And we've got one more film, right? Next month? Yes. And then we wrap up this whole series. This has been uh, an amazing adventure for, for hopefully for everybody watching, definitely for me, getting to watch the films with you, getting to hear uh, all your insight and just the conversation was really tremendous so thank you both and we will thank see you. you next month merry christmas happy Hanukkah. all right well thank you everybody for joining us this evening and watching the film and staying tuned for the conversation i want to thank our members the museum staff specifically maggie who is behind the scenes running everything and a big thank you to everyone that joined 
Please make sure you check the museum's website at thewestmoreland.org for upcoming virtual programs, as well as our final film airing next month. We hope everyone has a safe and happy holiday. Thank you, and please have an excellent evening.